and welcome to Beaver Stadium. A lot of people wonder, why is it called Beaver Stadium if they're the Nittany Lions? Well, here's your answer. General James A. Beaver, who was the president of the university for several years, but he's got a real local connection to where we're from at Central Baptist Church. He was actually born in Millerstown in 1837, and he's the gentleman that also served in the Civil War, became a general, but endured four different wounds, battle wounds, and continued to go back and serve. And after that, he became president of the university. And so he's got quite a history and quite a man to follow. And, and his story is intriguing. We're not here to talk about him completely. As we go this way, we're looking at the, one of the main gates where students always entered. And I had the pleasure of uh, visiting here one time with a good friend of mine. We got in line about 5 o'clock in the morning. And uh, we wanted to be front row. We didn't quite get front row, but we got about 7th row right on the right on the, the goal line uh, where Penn State scored the winning touchdown at the last moment near the end of the game. And what a wonderful place to be. Well worth my time and investment of losing some sleep. Um, now the traffic getting home, that was another story. But here's the thing. like If you've, if you've ever been inside of this place on game day, the, the atmosphere is absolutely electric. One of the most exciting atmospheres I've ever been a part of. Uh, probably the, the biggest exciting time I had ever been in here was when a running back by the name of Larry Johnson broke the 2,000-yard mark for the year, season. And, man, the place just absolutely erupted. Flash bulbs literally flying all over the stadium. It was, it was absolutely incredible. I never saw anything like it in my life. And it got me to thinking about uh, a passage in Hebrews where, as exciting as this place is on game day, especially when the Nittany Lions are doing well and winning, it doesn't even come close to the cloud of witnesses that are going to be surrounding us in heaven. In Hebrews 12, it says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangled us, us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The author of Hebrews, he, he writes this, and, he, and, and of course, in, in writing to uh, a group of Hebrew people, they understand at this time during their history that, that the Roman athletic group, uh, the, the Olympics and all that stuff, it was huge. It was very important to their culture. And so he writes this letter, and he helps them to understand there's a huge cloud of witnesses that watch us as we continue to serve God and follow Christ. And he says, it's so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, on game day, I forget exactly how big this stadium is. I know it's 110,000 plus. It doesn't even come close to the crowd of witnesses that are going to see us as we continue to serve God as they watch from heaven and enjoy the show. Um, it says to remove every encumbrance. See, when a runner went and ran in, in a race, of course, they would they would remove everything that slowed them down. When you go in here, I'll bet there's some guys on this football team that love to fish. But I'm guessing they don't walk in there with their hip waders on. Of course not. It would slow them down. Uh, there's some guys in there that probably absolutely love their music. But they don't walk into the stadium with, with a guitar on their shoulder. Of course not. It would slow them down. When they walk through that tunnel, they are so focused on, on performing and doing their job and winning this football game that they remove everything that's going to slow them down. And that's how, that's how we're told to be as well as we prepare to serve our God, to not let anything hinder us, nothing to encumber us, remove all that stuff, get it out of the way so that we can do our absolute best to follow Christ. We're told to fix our eyes on Jesus. We need to know what our goal is, what our prize is, and that's pleasing our Savior and serving Him to the utmost and greatest of our abilities. So our eyes have to be so laser focused that we don't get distracted by all the things that are going on around us. When those guys are in the middle of a game, they're not looking up in the stands and counting how many people they can see and, and trying to order corn dogs and, and slushies and popcorn and all that stuff. Their focus is on the game. They can deal with that stuff when it's over. And that's exactly what we can do. There's a lot of things in this world that, that come along and distract us and, and try to steal our vision and take it away from what's truly important. 
Their author comes along and says, don't, don't get into that stuff. Fix your eyes on Jesus so that you're absolutely ready to deal with what it is that he has for you. He also says, look at Jesus. Look what he did for you. He endured the cross. He despised the shame. And now he has sat down at the throne of God. It's kind of like saying Jesus has already reached that, that championship level. And, and that is motivation for us. That's inspiration for us to continue to do our best, to give our absolute best, so, so that we too can be promoted to glory one day. We don't want to be pulled away and distracted. We want to be given all the rewards that we are justly deserve through his, his power. For you consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself. See, when Jesus came as sinner, he came and, and died on the cross, he was put up there by sinners that he actually was coming to save. Matter of fact, I remember on the cross when he prayed for the, for the uh, Roman soldier, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. That's, a, that's an awful lot of compassion. I'm not sure I would ever have that much compassion in my heart. But following Christ has helped me get a lot closer. But he, he died at their hands. For us, we are sinners. And so we have to understand that if, if we have bad things happen to us, it's not like we can sit back and say, well, I'm innocent. I don't deserve any of this. The reality is the wages of sin are death. And because we have sin, we do deserve death. But in his grace, he lets us continue to live and come to know his grace and his saving grace as well says, for you have not resisted yet to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. Man, when these guys go in the field, I mean, there's sometimes, you know, not, not too much, but there's sometimes some scabs get ripped open, and they get some broken bones, they get some painful injuries. But, you know, he's, he's, he's telling, the author's telling these Hebrew readers that you haven't, you haven't tried hard enough to not sin. Like, you're not even willing to shed a little blood for this. Because you're continuing to protect yourself. And he's telling them, you need to be willing to give everything. Just like these guys, when they go out in the field, like they're willing to give everything because the people, their teammates around them that are there and supporting them, they sacrifice for one another. We also have the, the uh, fans in the crowd where they're cheering and, and encourage them on. Look, our, our, our fans are so much bigger. Our fans are apostles. Our fans are missionaries are people that have continued to go out and sacrifice for Jesus while they lived and no longer live. And we have an incredible cloud of witnesses before us. He says that he wants us to keep our eyes on Jesus and remember what he did so that we do not grow weary. Again, man, if we go inside that stadium and, and you're down to the fourth quarter and these guys have already fought and, and they fought as hard as they could for so long, they're, they're tired. I don't care how good a shape you're in. When you're going all out all the time, you're still going to be sucking wind at the end. If you're not, you're probably not running hard enough at the end. And here's the thing. He's encouraged them like, like all the way to the end. Remember what Jesus did. He went all the way to the end. You know, games, man, I've heard this a million times from coaches. Games aren't won in the first quarter. They're won in the fourth quarter. They're won in the last two minutes. You can have a bad game all the way up to the end, but if you get it right at the end, you can pull out a victory. You know, the same is kind of true with Jesus. We can have a, a lot of mess-ups in our life. We can, we can do a lot of dumb things. But if we get it right at the end, if we, if we turn and we, we put our faith in Him, we trust Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, no matter how bad the first three quarters of our life have gone, if we do that in the closing seconds of the game, we sneak out a major victory. Now, that's not the best way to do it, because the best way to do it is to be following Jesus our whole life so that we're storing up treasures in heaven. And we're going to get a lot more joy out of knowing Christ through our life than we will in, in just sneaking in at the end. But at the same time, I want you to know there's always hope. As long as you're willing to, to turn, repent from your sins, and follow Him, there's always hope. And so I want to encourage you, just like Jesus went all the way to the end, we too need to follow Him all the way to the end. We have a great cloud of witnesses. There's a lot of people cheering for us, a lot of people cheering for you. So let's make sure we give them our best and follow God to the best of our ability. Thanks so much, and God bless.